And welcome to episode number 076 of Something Else with Aria and Not KJ. Feast your hair holes on this week's episode as we take a look at Mid-South Wrestling from January 29th, 1983. My name is Aria, and welcome to the show. So, first of all, go Bills. They beat the Steelers last uh, last Monday, I guess, and are going to now go on and beat the Chiefs this coming weekend. So, go Buffalo. So that was the highlight of my weekend. <laughs> Let's talk about the low light before we get into Mid-South. So I have a new job. I work in Rhode Island. I'm about, I don't know, five, ten miles away from Providence, maybe a little bit more, but it, it's right in that area. Now, if you're from the uh, from this general area, you are aware that out of the blue, with apparently nobody being aware of this until it happened, they began doing construction on um, a bridge in Providence that, you know, is basically killing traffic going to and from uh, Massachusetts from Providence, or in my case, going to and from Providence from Massachusetts. Basically, it takes an eight-lane highway and cuts it down to four lanes. And because at the end of the day, people don't know how to drive, you know, it fucking sucks. But the reason why I bring this up is because, again, I'm working near Providence these days. And last Friday, I decided, you know what would be fun? You know what would be interesting? I'm going to go to a minor league hockey game. The Providence Bruins are playing the wilkes barre Scranton Penguins. So it's my current local minor league hockey team versus my former local minor league hockey team. This sounds pretty fucking interesting. I'm going to go. I've, I, I love hockey. It's a great sport. It's a great game. It's fun to see live. So let's do it here, folks. Let's jump in and do this. So I buy my ticket. And work ends at 5 o'clock, and I'm just going to go. I'm not going to take the highway. I'm going to take the back roads up there. You know, we'll get there around 5.30. Kill some time before the game starts at 7. It was a great plan. It was a fantastic plan. Then I left work. I go out and look at my car. And it looks like my tire is low. Now, I am a complete neophyte when it comes to cars. We can all point to me. We can all laugh at me. I don't know shit about cars. So when I saw that, I was thinking, is it always look like that? I don't know. But, you know, I don't know why it would be like that if it wasn't supposed to be. So I'm like, get in the car. I'm going to go to Providence. Great. So I get out. I start driving in the general direction. And it becomes very obvious very quickly that I cannot drive on this tire. So I pull into a nearby shopping center. This is now like 5, 10, 5, 15 in the afternoon. And I go out, take another look at the tire. And I can actually push my thumb into the tire. That is how much air has now left my tire. I go around my car just to double check that that's not supposed to happen. And it isn't in case you're listening to this and are like me and don't know any better. Um, I should point out, by the way, when I went to work, there were zero issues. There were zero issues. Got to work with no problem. Pulled in. Didn't notice anything when I got out of the car. Didn't notice anything when I went to my car for my lunch break. That's all. So I get out. And I call my insurance. It's 5, 10, 5, 15 on a Friday afternoon. And of course, my insurance is closed because, you know, it's Friday afternoon after 5 o'clock. I would have been surprised if somebody did answer. But it's okay. It's okay because they have 24-hour roadside assistance. 24-hour roadside assistance. Do you know how long 24 hours is? It's the entire day, 24 hours. So if, let's say, at 5.15 on a Friday afternoon, you have a flat tire and you need assistance, 
you call your 24-hour roadside assistance hotline, which I do. And I get an automated message telling me that the 24-hour roadside assistance hotline was closed for the weekend. They would be open back up on Tuesday. My 24-hour roadside assistance was closed. I told somebody else the story, and they're like, well, did they technically say 24 straight hours? Maybe it's 24 total hours in the week. I laughed. I wasn't laughing Friday, but I laughed when I heard that one. So then, faithful listeners, I, I'm freaking the fuck out. Because like I said, I don't know shit about cars. So I'm in uh, fucking Warwick, Rhode Island. And I live in New Bedford, Massachusetts, which, you know, if there wasn't a crap ton of traffic, it would be about a 45, 50, 55 minute drive. And I have, you know, my local garage that I do take my car to for shit. And I call them up because they also have a towing, you know, component. And they're like, well, to to tow you back to New Bedford, it would cost you almost five hundred dollars. And that's when I'm just freaking, freaking, freaking the fuck out because I don't have five hundred dollars at this point. And. So I'm like, let me see what I can do. And while I'm freaking out, I think to myself, what about AAA? I'm not a AAA member, but maybe if I sign up for AAA, they can help me out. And sure enough, I go to the AAA website. I plop down my nine bucks to sign up. And I call them. At this point, emotions are running wild. And you... And you may laugh at me, but I was just losing my mind at this point. And so I called AAA, a very nice woman answered the phone. And she basically told me, yeah, we'll send somebody out. Now, for this reason, that reason, that reason over there, it's going to cost me money because I literally just signed up. So it's like, fine. Fine, let let's do this. Send the tow truck to take me to New Bedford. It was only be two hundred dollars as opposed to five hundred dollars. Great, awesome. And then for some reason, like twenty minutes later, I call them back, and I speak with a different young lady, another very helpful woman. By the way, speaking to these two women, I cried because it was the first time all afternoon, all evening, anybody even fucking helping me at this point. Which, by the way, at this point, it's now six thirty, seven o'clock. And she says to me, do you have a spare tire? I'm like, I've had this car three years. I'd like to think if I had a spare tire, I would know I had a spare tire. But she's like, go to the back of your car, do this, that, and the other thing. And holy fuck, I've got a spare tire in my car. So great. So they're going to cancel the tow and send out somebody to fix my tire, to replace the tire. Great. Great, 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 great. So somebody comes out, it's now 7.30, 7.45, you know, going on 8 o'clock. And he can't get the fucking tire off of my car. It is rusted on. And they couldn't, and he couldn't get it off. So it's okay because they're going to have, have somebody else come out. They're going to have a, a rubber mallet, you know, basically a small sledgehammer. They're going to come and knock it off. Great. Awesome. Send the second guy out. Second guy comes. It's now after 8 o'clock. It's 8.15. Um, by the way, again, it's like I've been there since 5.15. So it's now 8.15. And the guy comes out, and he can't get it off with the fucking mallet either. So after a little bit more discussion, and... We discover that as long as I get it towed within three miles, it's free. So I have it towed to a place in Warwick, which was less than three miles away for free, and then take a $50 Uber ride home. 
which expensive, obviously, but also still less expensive than either of the toe quotes I had. So I get home on Friday night at like 930. And that was one of those nights where I'm like, fuck my diet. And I got a pizza with a lot of sauce and cheese and everything on it. And I say, this place opens up tomorrow morning at 730. I will be fucking awake at 730 and call them. And sure enough, I call them and they're like, yep, we'll get to you. We have your car. We have the key. We have a note from the people who dropped it off. Yada, yada, yada. As soon as, uh, as soon as we get to it, we'll give you a call. Long story short, they call me 30 minutes later and say the car is ready. Apparently, it did not take very much effort to knock that tire off on their end. God knows what they did instead. So since all my local friends who have cars are still asleep because it's Saturday morning at 8 o'clock and only crazy people like myself are up at that time, I take another $50 Uber ride back to Warwick where I get my car and by the way, they obviously put on a new tire. They didn't just give me the old spare tire on there because they knew I'd have to replace it anyway. And so long story short, that was my Saturday night or that was my Friday night. Saturday morning, I got my car back. My car is great again. I love my car. Like legitimately, the last time I'd worked on my car, when I went and picked it up, I gave it a hug. Like, I know that sounds silly. I know that sounds stupid. But there's probably somebody sitting out there, a car owner is like, I totally get that. I totally understand that. All right. So none of y'all are listening to this to hear me talk about my car. Y'all want to hear me talk about some wrestling. All righty. So let's go to Mid-South Wrestling, January 29th, 1983, from the Irish McNeil Boys Club in Shreveport, Louisiana. And let's take a listen to this week's commentators. Boyd Pierce and Why God Why Paul Bosch. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Mid South Wrestling Television Network. I'm your host, Boyd Pierce, and a lot of exciting action signed by matchmaker Grizzly Smith. It'll be headlined by a North American Heavyweight Championship match as Stagger Lee defends his coveted title and belts against the challenge of Ted DiBiase. Mr. USA, Tony Atlas from Roanoke, Virginia, is here. Also, Chavo Guerrero, the fine Latin star from Mexico, takes on a rugged Matt Bourne. It all adds up to 60 minutes of wrestling excitement. The men to tell you about it, 34 consecutive years as commentator for Houston Wrestling, also the top promoter in professional Matt sport of wrestling, it's Mr. Paul Bosch. Paul, welcome. Boy, thank you. I still have trouble getting this thing over my cauliflower ears. <laughs> We're going to have a lot of good action tonight, and I think we're going to get right down to it. The first event is in the ring, so let's go for the introduction. 60 minutes of exciting wrestling action featuring Paul Bosch on comedy. All right, I guess I can't get through 60 minutes unless we get through the first minute. So this week is the match we were supposed to have last week, Stagger Lee versus Ted DiBiase for the North American title along with Chavo Guerrero versus Matt Bourne. As we mentioned last week, Chavo wants the Louisiana title held by Rat Pack member Jim Duggan. And so I guess he's going to go through Matt Bourne en route to Hacksaw. We go to the ring for our first match. It is Tom Ernesto Jr. versus Tim Horner. It's an expiration of time match that started the show. Paul Bosch is already promising to make this the longest 46 minutes of my life because, thankfully, I don't have to do a full 60 with him. I only have to do 46. Like, legitimately. Think of every awful WWF announcer you've seen in your life. From Lord Alfred Hayes, Gorilla Monsoon, Todd Grisham, Michael Cole, um... Fucking Adnan Burke. Who who was that other guy that Jimmy Smith? I guess he wasn't that bad. He just didn't work out. But think about every bad WWE commentator who we've had on WWE, you know, in our lifetime. And think about the fact that, you know, there was at least something moderately charming about them. 
you know, something that at the very least you could make fun of while watching. There is nothing moderately charming about Paul Bosch. There's nothing that I could even really sit here and make fun of him about. The closest I get is when is how he doesn't say tag, he says touch. That's as close as we get to being able to make fun of Paul Bosch's commentary on this show. Legitimately the worst commentator I don't want to say ever because I haven't watched, you know, every territory ever, but for fuck's sake, you know, I I don't fucking know. Anyway, Horner wins with a Fez press that, just like last week, Bosch calls a flying body scissors. And actually, it, even worse, he calls it a flying body scissors like Lou Fez. So why he didn't just call it a Fez press? Your guess is as good as mine. So Skander Akbar has randomly appeared at the desk, so let's randomly listen to him. Boy, we have a film clip from Houston, Texas, in which General Akbar's mighty man Kamala completely pulverized the great Canadian heavyweight Mike Sharp. I want the viewers at Mid-South area to see the relentless force, the burning desire to excel that this man has within himself. Let's hear it. Let's see it. All right, let's watch the match that General Skander Akbar is talking about right now. So General Skander Akbar randomly appears and randomly gets to pitch it to a match from Houston where Kamala with Friday and without General Skandor Akbar takes on Iron Mike Sharp. Now this is from Houston with Akbar doing commentary over the match. Akbar mentions that he got cards and letters and phone calls congratulating him on getting Kamala in his stable. And since he doesn't specify who, I would like to think that Akbar doesn't have an unlisted phone number, and instead fans are calling him up in the middle of the night just to congratulate him. So this is the most competitive match we've seen Kamala in on Mid-South TV. Sharp is only getting the occasional offensive move, but that is still more than the other opponents that Kamala's ever had here. Mind Keeping in mind, I think this is actually the first non-enhancement match we've seen Kamala in, so that really tells you everything you need to know. Sharp was busted wide open somehow, and Kamala clawed at his head to make it worse. Akbar tells the story about how the blood makes Kamala even more of a savage, and then reminded us of an angle from a few months ago when Akbar spent all this money to get the pile driver legalized, and then Sharp kept dropping him with a pile driver repeatedly. Um, as Kamala stalked Sharp, Akbar said, he's coming. He's coming. I don't know. That sounds like a personal issue to me, but whatever. Legitimately, I think this is the longest singles match I've ever seen Kamala in. Like, literally the only other match I can ever remember him being in that went longer than five minutes was that god-awful War Games match he was in. In 1995, was like Hogan, Sting, Luger, and Randy Savage versus Kamala, Meng, John Tenta, and the Zodiac, Brutus Beefcake. And that, I mean, he was in the match, but I mean, I wouldn't really, you know, call that really a Kamala match that went 20 minutes, even though technically it was a match with Kamala in that went about 20 minutes. Anywho, this match, this one-on-one -on -one match, went seven minutes. And Kamala won clean over, at least that would one point, was a top baby face in Iron Mike Sharp. So I guess that pretty much tells you that the Iron Mike Sharp push is essentially over. Then we got what was supposed to be our North American title match where North American champion Stagger Lee was scheduled to defend the championship against Ted DiBiase in a match that was supposed to happen last week, but Stagger Lee no-showed last week, conveniently at the same show Junkyard Dog returned. DiBiase came out and had Duggan and Matt Bourne at ringside, so Grizzly Smith, rapist extraordinaire, 
appeared ringside and announced that Stagger Lee no showed again, but announced that someone else had challenged Ted DiBiase to a come as you are match. And DiBiase was pissed that he lost his title match and even more pissed when out came Junkyard Dog. And so then we get a come as you are match with Junkyard Dog versus Ted DiBiase. DiBiase rightfully flipped the fuck out, saying he does not want this match. Dog ran wild before Bourne and Duggan hit the ring. Immediately, Tony Atlas and, quote, our good friend Paul Bosch, number two, hit the ring for the save. And that was it. I got to tell you, this is the second week in a row now where this happened. And I know it's just an angle. I get that. But they are just falsely advertising matches now, which is bound to piss the fans off. And ultimately, they're not even giving you a good alternative. Last week's alternative was Ted DiBiase and Matt Bourne in an enhancement match. This week was Junkyard Dog coming out for 30 seconds. And then, you know, the heels running in and the baby faces running in for the save. And that was it. It's not you're not getting a good alternative on what you're advertised here. And, you know, I get it's TV at the end of the fucking day, it's TV and it's there to build up the live events and you're not, and you don't want to give shit away or at least give a lot of shit away, but you're going to piss off your TV viewing audience because here's the thing. If a million people are watching, you know, the TV show, there are not a million people coming to the TV coming to the live shows. So if you're telling them something's going to happen and something doesn't happen, eventually they're going to get pissed off and stop watching. So Tony Atlas was out next to take on Don Bass. As we talked about last week, Don Bass is about a foot shorter than Kane and looks otherwise just like him. Just take Kane's 300 pounds and spread it out a bit more. And that's Don Bass. Bosch says that it takes a lot of money to put that much muscle on your body. I am sure he meant with gym memberships and weights and whatnot. But all I could think of was how much George Zahorian was charging back in 83. Anyway, Atlas won quickly with a big splash. This is going to be a long fucking show. Uh, Because we are, we have more than half of a show to go. And we are knee deep into the expiration of time matches. In fact, essentially, this whole fucking show is one expiration of time match after another, with the exception of the one main event match that actually comes up that we'll get to, which is Matt Bourne versus Chavo Guerrero. And the rest of this was a pretty fucking skippable episode. And that was given to us next with Kelly Kaniski and Marty Lundy versus Tony Torres and Buddy Landell. (sighs) <sighs> Keep in mind, there's only so much I can complain about a match with Arn Anderson and Buddy Landell wrestling each other. And like I said, we still have Matt Bourne versus Chavo Guerrero, so at least that's something. Paul Bosch calls uh, Kelly Kaniski the top rising star in wrestling today. Thankfully, that rising star crashed before you... Uh, because can you imagine Kelly Kaniski as the NWA world champion or fuck Kelly Kaniski in feuds for the NWA world title? I mean, he's better than George Goulas at least, but that's a pretty fucking low bar here, folks. All right. So for some reason, I made mention of an eight second clip here with Paul Bosch. So let's see what the hell I'm talking about. Torres and, and now Torres stepped in, right into a cauldron. He has both Kaniski and Lundy ready for him. And, oh, that was a hard, hard slam. And of course, the effectiveness of slams can't be doubted. They take it from you physically. Okay, don't know what the point is. He And here's what I wrote. Bosch says Torres has Kaniski and Lundin ready for him. Oh, that that's what it is. So Bosch says Torres has uh, Kaniski and Lundin ready for him. Which, to me, if all you're doing is listening to this and not watching it, sounds to me like he's saying Torres has the advantage. However, while this is happening, 
Himiski was laying into him and dropped him with the body slam that you heard on camera here. Bosch says you cannot break a bone with a forearm. Yes, you can. Yes, it would be a freak accident. But yes, you could break your forearm. Anyway, at this point, this match went to shit. Shit, 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 shit. Torres made the hot tag to Buddy Landell. Landell hits one move, and Torres begged for the tag and got back in. Torres bends over for a backdrop, but was turned in the wrong direction, and Kaniski basically ran into him, which legitimately makes the crowd laugh. Kaniski sends Torres into the buckles, and Torres flails backwards and hits Kaniski in the head. Legitimately, check out the video version of this show and check out the ending of this match because Jesus H. Christ, that was a, the Botchamania Hall of Fame right there, folks. Kaniski did the smartest thing we've ever seen on this show and said, fuck it, and finished the match there, winning with a back suplex. Holy Fuck on a fuck. What the hell is going on here in Mid-South? But hey, something is going right. Because up next, it's Matt Bourne versus Chavo Guerrero. And they spelled Chavo's name correctly on the graphics. Jesus H. Christ, that only took three months. Chavo Guerrero. C-H-A-V-O-G-U-E-R-R-E-R-O. I no longer have to call him Chavo Guerrero, Chavo Guerrero, and every other bad spelling that they came up with. It's Chavo Guerrero. All right. So Ted DiBiase is pissed still, as you can imagine. And he's got something to say here as he interrupts the introduction of our next match. This event is for one call. Before or... you introduce this next match, I got something to say. I'm going to get to the bottom of this junkyard dog stagger lead thing once and for all. Now, this is two times they've tried to railroad me. Two times I was supposed to wrestle for the North American title against stagger lead. One week he doesn't show up. The first week that Junkyard Dog shows his face. And the next week, he doesn't show up tonight. And here comes the Junkyard Dog again. It's very simple. Junkyard Dog, Stagger Lee, Stagger Lee, Junkyard Dog. They're both the same person. Now I'm taking my lawyers, and I'm going to the president of Mid-South, Charlie Lay, to matchmaker Grizzly Smith, and I'm going to get something done. I want to match with Stagger Lee on the North American title around my waist next week. If it had been any other anybody else, he'd have had to forfeit the match and give me the title, and something's going to be done. Well, you don't have to worry about this snap because I'm going to take care of him. Right well, time will tell. This event is for one fall or remain. All right. So DiBiase interrupts the introduction of our match, and he wants to get to the bottom of this Junkyard Dog Stagger Lee thing. And Reese or Bowden, like, I love Reese, like, literally, he, the greatest announcer ever in some regard just because there's so much to say about poor Reeser. Reeser is laughing because he knows what bullshit this is and he's not even trying to hide it at this point. DiBiase is demanding that next week either he gets a match with Stagger Lee or he gets the title via forfeit and correctly points out that if anybody else no-showed two matches they take the title from him and run him out of town. He's not lying, folks. Bill Watts does not take kindly to no-shows. We just saw Gino Hernandez get buried last week for no-showing. And Stagger Lee is not only not buried, he is still the North American champion of record. So Matt Foreman versus Chavo Guerrero, two guys with medium-length black hair and short blue trunks. Interesting. What the fuck is with this show today? They do a drop down, and I think, I think, I think, I think Chavo was supposed to duck for a backdrop. But first of all, when Bourne hits the ropes, 
Chavo runs at them as well. So Bourne basically has to stop. Then Chavo ducks, and I think he thought Bourne would block the uh, backdrop, but Bourne starts going up for the backdrop, and then after time stood still, Bourne uses a small package into the ropes. Chavo uses the body slam and goes for an elbow, but Bourne rolls out of the way way too early, and Chavo then hops on one foot over towards Matt Bourne and drops the elbow instead. What drugs was everybody on this week? Thankfully, at the end of the day, unlike with our last match, where we had a lot of green guys, you know, this ultimately is a match between two veterans who know how to work. So when things were getting fucked up, they slowed the fuck down, grabbed the hold, and started over. Chavo missed a middle rope dive on purpose. Bourne picked up Chavo for a body slam, and Chavo accidentally kicks the referee. Bourne locks on the full Nelson, outruns Jim Duggan, who mistimes the spear, and he nails Bourne instead. The heels with a two-on-one attack. Bourne goes up top for the bombs away, but Tony Atlas runs in for the save and helps clear the ring. The bell eventually rings, and somehow Chavo is declared the winner by disqualification. Okay. Then we get our last match here on the show that I can't say will never end because the show is obviously coming to an end, but Jesus H. Christ. Mr. Wrestling 2 and Art Cruz versus Tug Taylor and Joe Stark. Who, did, who the fuck did Mr. Wrestling 2 piss off to get in this match where he teams with a jobber against two more jobbers? Like, was there a massive snowstorm here in Louisiana and half the crew didn't make it? And that's how we ended up with this hell of a show we got here today. Cruz and Stark were so eager to get some degree of spotlight here. Two tags in, as did Tug, and two took him over with a side headlock takeover, as it was announced that next week, Andre the Giant will be here. Oh, holy fuck on a fuck. So Cruz tags in, slaps on a headlock, and they go to the corner. Tug shoots him off, and instead, they're in the corner, folks. And you don't ever have to have been in the wrestling ring to know that if you're if you're in the corner and you're being shot off, where should you be headed? The straight line here, folks. Corner to corner. You're being shot off, you hit the opposite corner. Or whatever you do, you go in the direction of the corner. So Tug shoots him off, and instead of going corner to corner, or really even into the ropes that he was pointed towards, um, Cruz runs off the opposite rope. I'm sorry. What the fuck? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying here. I'm sorry. There's so much shittiness going on here. I'm losing track of my notes here. He runs off the opposite ropes. Tug slaps on a side headlock, and that's where we go to hell. Cruz shoots Tug off and bends for a backdrop. And Tug is like, nah, motherfucker, and kind of throws Cruz down. They try again, since apparently Tug was supposed to do a leapfrog. And much like how I once crashed down on my brother's neck when he, for some reason he let me do a leapfrog to him, Tug leaped, Doug bent at his knees, he leapt as high in the air as he could, and came down right on Art Crew's shoulders and back. Holy fuck. So Cruz fought back, and made the tag to two. Two is like, I am not doing an expiration of time, time limit draw with these schmucks. And one with a botched finish. He used the body slam. Joe Stark kicks out at two, but the referee don't give a fuck and count at three. And then they just continue doing what they're supposed to do anyway. And the show ends with Mr. Wrestling 2 hitting a running knee lift and going for the pin. What the fuck happened on this show? 
Legit, the last half of this show was one match after another with at least one botched spot. Legit, I never really watched the Botchamania stuff, but if they don't have a bunch of Mid-South stuff on there, send this to that guy who does the Botchamania stuff. And we we have a we have some Botchamania stuff here on this episode of Mid-South Wrestling. No doubt here, folks. All right, so that's going to do it for Mid-South. You know, that's going to do it for Mid-South, actually, uh, in the entire month of January. So when we come back here next week for more Mid-South, we are into February 1983. Yay! And from here, we go to Weird News of the Week. And that is Weird News of the Week presented by Nobody. Nobody. The company that sponsors nothing. And for that, we go to UPI.com. We go to our old friend Ben Hooper for this week's weird news. Stowaway cat takes 800-mile journey under hood of moving van. A cat who went missing from her owner's home turned out to have gone for an 800-mile round trip across England and Wales in the engine compartment of a moving van. Laura Teal said her family's eight-year-old Siamese cat Jasmine failed to return home for dinner at her West at her Weston Supermare home on the same day that her neighbors moved to Lanelli, Wales. It was two days later that Teal received a call from a veterinarian in Dawlish, England. Jasmine turned out to have crawled into the engine of one of the moving vans parked on the street the day she disappeared and went on a trip from Weston Supermare to Lanelli and back the driver of Jeff Boer's home in Devon. Boer drove the truck the following day for jobs that took him through Exeter, Honelton, Bournemouth, and Chippenham. He finally discovered Jasmine under the hood of his vehicle after the feline had been stowing away for almost 800 miles. The cat was taken to the vet in Dawlish and scanned for a microchip, which revealed Teal's contact information. Teal said Jasmine was a bit dehydrated from her journey, but otherwise uninjured. I got to tell you, anytime I'm going to see weird news that features a cat, you bet your last dollar I'm going to read that one. And that was a cute story. All right, so that's going to do it for this week. Hopefully my weekend is less adventurous than this last one was. Go Bills, and we'll talk to you again in seven days. and welcome to this week's edition of Mid-South Wrestling Television Network. I'm your host, Boyd Pierce, and a lot of exciting action signed by matchmaker Grizzly Smith. It'll be headlined by a North American Heavyweight Championship match as Stagger Lee defends his coveted title and belts against the challenge of Ted DiBiase. Mr. USA, Tony Atlas from Roanoke, Virginia, is here. 
Also, Chavo Guerrero, the fine Latin star from Mexico, takes on a rugged Matt Bourne. It all adds up to 60 minutes of wrestling excitement. The men to tell you about it, 34 consecutive years as commentator for Houston Wrestling, also the top promoter in professional Matt Sport of Wrestling, it's Mr. Paul Bosch. Paul, welcome. Boy, thank you. I still have trouble getting this thing over my cauliflower ears. <laughs> We're going to have a lot of good action tonight, and I think we're going to get right down to it. The first event is in the ring, so let's go for the introduction. This event is for one fall with a 10-minute time limit in the red corner at 240 pounds from Houston, Texas, Tom Renesto, Jr. And in the blue corner at 222 pounds from Knoxville, Tennessee, Tim Horner. And the cheers for Tim Horner, dressed in green against the long black tight clad of Tom Renesto Jr., Rick Ferrara. The referee called for the bell. Here's Paul Bosch. Yes, and there is Tim Horner, a young man who is gaining a lot of attention and earning it the old-fashioned way, may I, I may say, by sweat and by muscle and by putting something into every minute he spends in that ring. As you notice there, that arm drag as he tossed Tom Ernesto over. He turned it quickly into an arm bar, not a waste of motion. And this is the sign of a man who spends much time in the gymnasium, much time on fundamentals, and then knows enough to apply them when he gets into competition. Tom Ernesto looking to use the added weight that he has. And I, I wonder about Tim Horner going into that side headlock, I looked to me like he was setting him up for it perfectly. The arm drag puts Tom Ernesto again underneath, and that same arm bar that takes that arm reacts against the elbow and the shoulder at the same time. The manner in which he's holding it now, a false move by Tom Ernesto, even though the hold was on his arm. If he made the move, he could have broken his arm. Quick move by Tim Horner. Look at that young man. And you talk about uh, dexterity and a quick switch. And he swings over to get the further arm and to roll him down to the canvas. There was a succession of moves that uh, took a lot of following. Took a lot of doing, too. I don't mind telling you. And Horner is using the approach that if he can keep Tom Renesto busy enough, wondering where the next attack is going to take place, then he's going to get what he wants. Whether he makes a feint, two feints, or three feints at something he doesn't want, he comes up with what he can use. And in this case, following up on that arm hole and in using the arm hole to add to what he has already done to it. But, but Tom Renesto hadn't hit him in the jaw before. And he's trying to prove that doing something the first time is effective, too. So Renesto tries now to pound Tim Horner down onto that top rope. Tries to lay it in there where he's going to suffer from the contact with the rope as well as the contact with what appears to be a blow of the fist in that rapid punch attack. Now Horner's in trouble. He is outweighed. He's got to come up with something that keeps... Tom Renesto from using the full effects of his weight, and Renesto is well aware of it. A good small man can beat a good big man under some conditions, but if he takes too much punishment, he's going to find that he has left his fight up in the dressing room. Hard landing. And Renesto is smart enough and quick enough to get on top, but he's not powerful enough to be able to hold Tim Horner down to the canvas for the count of three. That'll help Horner's cause. A well-placed foot can certainly offset a great deal of science and a great deal of rough stuff. Bouncing across the ring is Tom Renesto, and probably now wondering exactly what his father would have told him to do under these conditions since his father was a well-known heavyweight wrestler less than a generation ago. Top man, Tim Horner, there's two. And there was close, I don't mind telling you. And flying body scissor, and again, he looks like Luthez going through the air. Hit him high, hold him tight, and pin him down 
to the canvas, and Horner did it. And Tim Horner gains the victory in the opening event. We'll be back after this important message. Boy, we have a film clip from Houston, Texas, in which General Akbar's mighty man, Kamala, completely pulverized the great Canadian heavyweight, Mike Sharp. I want the viewers at Mid-South area to see the relentless force, the burning desire to excel that this man has within himself. Let's see it. Let's see it. All right, let's watch the match that General Skandar Akbar is talking about right now. Never before in my career as a wrestler and now the world's greatest wrestling manager have I ever been associated with the likes of Kamala. Such power and devastation, 360 pounds. Now you see him in the ring with all of the regalia, the earrings, the mask, the spear. Friday accompanying uh, Kamala into the squared circle, ready to do battle. He'll be going up against Mike Sharp, who is a tremendous man himself. Now I've felt the wrath of Mike Sharp. I know how powerful this Canadian heavyweight is. But I want the viewers and television land to see just exactly what a tremendous and relentless pursuit that Kamala has. Coming from the Sam Houston Coliseum in Houston, Texas, there you see Mike Sharp. In just a few moments, this match will get underway. You see Jerry, uh, referee Jerry Usher giving instructions to Mike Sharp. Now, uh, Friday getting the great uh, Ugandan warrior ready for action. As I've said before, I have never, and I've had a lot of great talent in the general stable, but I have never seen anything like Kamala. Across the country, I've been getting uh, the cards and letters and telephone calls and uh, congratulating me on the <clears throat> my association with Kamala. There he goes, as you see. As I've told you before, the relentless pursuit, those chops to the head of Mike Sharp. Ooh, there's another one that has to sting. See big Mike Sharp going down, down, down. Once Kamala starts, he never lets it. Mike Sharp out of the ring at that point. Boom, there goes the ceremony, Vince. Out of the ring. Another chop outside. Boom. Mike Sharp goes down, as you can see. It's not easy to restrain a man like Kamala. I have communication with a man, but however, this man is almost uncontrollable. <laughs> Stalking uh, Mike Sharp now. Sharp up on the apron, back into the ring. Ooh, another one to the head. Now, these are just not ordinary chops that Kamala throws. These are devastating chops. I have never seen anything from the Orient, from wherever, that can even compare with Kamala. <clears throat> Mike Sharp with a nice move, a drop kick. Now notice all the power that Mike Sharp had with that drop kick. He did not, I repeat, Kamala did not go off this team. One at this point would have to admire Mike Sharp for uh, being game. Uh, however, perhaps you, you would say he, he is willing but very weary at this point. Kamala, a Ugandan warrior, pounding at the head of big Mike Sharp. The general's man, Kamala. And this man's campaign is over, if ever. He will rewrite the rest of the record books. I know of no one, I repeat, no one in this country, perhaps across the world, that can compare with this man. Now you see the crimson stained face of Mike Sharp. And that's all it takes when Kamala smells that crimson stained face. He goes after Mike Sharp. Just relentless, never letting up, never letting up. There he's got Sharp across the top rope. Of 
Mike Sharp still in it, willing, <laughs> but as I've said, very, very weary, staggering. Kamala knows, he smells victory. He knows enough to know that he's got his man exactly where he wants him. Sharp, throwing wildly, almost catching the referee on that wild shot. Oh, Just look at Kamala, never letting up. The agility of this man is unbelievable. 360 pounds, he moves like a lightweight. Reminding one of a panther moving through the jungle. Once again, catching Mike Sharp again with a chop coming across the ropes. Oh, there he goes. The power in this individual's hand is unbelievable. Mike Sharp, down. This has to be somewhat of a matter of revenge for the general, as you Mid-South uh, television viewers can remember a while back that Mike Sharp illegally put the general in a pile driver which I haven't forgotten. This is somewhat of a, as I've said, a revenge for the general. Oh, and you wonder how Mike Sharp can take the punishment that he's taking right now from the Ugandan heavyweight. Kamala just keeps coming, just keeps coming. Jerry Usher, the referee, probably never in his career has he ever officiated a match with such a such a savage as, uh, as Kamala. Kamala stalking around the ring, knowing that victory is near. Again to the head. Mike Sharp's going to have one big, powerful headache. This match is over. Sharp barely, barely able to stand. Kamala ripping away at the wound. Kamala, Kamala, a household word. People all across the land are talking about this man. Never before has a wrestler caused the controversy. And has wrecked havoc in an area like Kamala has. Now Kamala has Mike Sharp down on the apron, the bottom rope. Ah, tasting the crimson stain. Kamala. Stalking around the ring. He's got Mike Sharp it. Another one to the head. How can Mike Sharp stand the punishment? Kamala. Again, just relentless. Never letting up. When you step into the square circle with Kamala, you've got to pay the price. The mighty Ugandan. The general went to great expense to lease the services of this powerful heavyweight. Oh, my shot down again. Perpetual motion, agility. That's come on. Strength, power, my shot down once again. Flat. Now come on, it picks up my shot. As I've said, one of the strongest wrestlers in the business, a body slam. Now. This is no ordinary splash. I repeat, this is no ordinary splash. This is the trademark of Kamala. He turns his opponents down, face down. And this should be it. This is it. One, two, three. The mighty Kamala. And have you see a powerful man like Mike Sharp being pulverized by Kamala? There you have it, boy, the painted warrior chalks up another one. I have never been associated with such a devastating individual as the great Kamala, the Ugandan warrior. I'll have to agree with you on that, Skandor Akbar. And we have coming up next the North American Heavyweight Championship, Stagger Lee versus Ted DiBiase, right after this message from Mid-South Wrestling Television Network.
And now a title match for the North American Heavyweight Championship. This event is for one fall or remaining television time. In the red corner at 268 pounds from Omaha, Nebraska, a former North American Heavyweight Champion, Ted DiBiase. And it seems that Ted DiBiase has a couple of seconds in the ring with him. Sagalee hasn't showed up yet, but I've got someone else that wants to challenge Ted DiBiase, has challenged Ted DiBiase in a come as you are match. What? Well, you heard that. Stagger Lee has not made it to the arena. Well, who is it? Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm not wrestling him. I signed to wrestle Stagger Lee. They can't do this to me. This is they tried to do this to me in New Orleans and attacked me. Well, here it is. The junkyard dog. In a come as you are. Well, let's just settle right down to this because junkyard dog making his first appearance here in a long while, more than 90 days, is suddenly besieged by the entire rack pat as he fights off Ted DiBiase, Duggan, and Matt Bourne. And here comes... Tony Atlas, here comes number two, Mr. Wrestling number two, and now suddenly we've got a six-man gang war going as Duggan gets out of the ring, and there goes DBS, and there goes Bourne, and up in the ring, displaying his ability for the first time in more than 90 days is Junkyard Dog, whose friend Stagger Lee failed to come into the arena tonight for whatever reason we are not certain but junkyard dog said that man has done enough for me i'll do something for him and he offered to take the place of stagger lee so suddenly we have junkyard dog returning to the mat wars and that means excitement that's excitement paul and while we try to restore order here we'll be back with more action there'll be standby matches after this word from Mid-South Wrestling. This event is for one fall or remaining television time. In the red corner at 270 pounds from Pampa, Texas, Don Bass. And in the blue corner at 252 pounds from Roanoke, Virginia, Mr. USA Tony Atlas. Don Bass against Mr. USA Tony Atlas. Rick Pereira called for the bell and talk about settling down, Paul Bosch. These fans are stirred up as nobody but Junkyard Dog can stir them up. And Tony Atlas is another crowd stirrer, and in this particular case, he is being stirred as Don Bass questions the effectiveness of Tony's muscles and tries to prove that the rotund build has more power than the tremendously expensive musculature of Tony Atlas. Takes a lot of work and a lot of effort and a lot of money to be able to put that kind of muscle onto a body. And as he manhandles Don Bass, he proves that his theory could be the best after all. So Tony Atlas, certainly one of the prime favorites of all the Mid-South area from Houston Texas to New Orleans and up and down Louisiana into Oklahoma and Arkansas and Mississippi. Tony Atlas is a favorite, but right now as he has to prove it again, and you've got to prove it every time you step in that ring. You've got to be in top shape, and if you're going to be a top star, you have got to let these fans and your opponents know it. And Tony, with that high-flying drop kick of his, shows that muscles are have utility and 
purpose and as he oh, a flying cloud as he drops on Don Bass to squeeze him into that canvas and give Tony Atlas another win. And we'll have tag team action coming up following this word. It's tag team action now for one fall or remaining television time. In the red corner at 268 pounds from Vancouver, British Columbia, Kelly Kaniski. And his partner at 250 pounds from Rome, Georgia, Marty Lundy. In the blue corner at 238 pounds from Richmond, Virginia, Buddy Landell. And his partner at 221 pounds from Houston, Texas, Tony Torres. Kenny Kaniski and Marty Lundy pairing up against Buddy Landell and Tony Torres. Jerry Usher, the referee, Paul Bus. This is a standby match. We have time. We have lots of more excitement coming up. Chavo Guerrero taking on uh, Matt Bourne. And then Mr. Racing, too, is also here as time permits. But the one we settle down to right now, Boyd Pierce, is the one that puts Buddy Landell in that ring to take a side headlock on Marty Lundy. And as Buddy puts the squeeze on it, this young man who has a lot of promise and a lot of latent ability is going to get an opportunity to bring some of that to the surface. He's going to have to in order to stay in there against Lundy and Kaniski. Kaniski, the son of the former world champion. Oh, he stepped right on his nose with a vengeance. He, he came down and planted that foot right on the forehead and the nose. And the foot is big enough to have covered a lot of territory of Marty Lundy, and, he, and Marty steps out of that ring, and he's having problems. And so is Kelly Kaniski as Buddy Landell racing across that ring to try to catch him unawares. He didn't. The top rising young star in the game right now is Kelly Kaniski. Rough? Yes, he learned that at home. He learned it from his father. That's how his father won the world's heavyweight title, how he stayed the world's heavyweight champion for four years, how he was one of Canada's top athletes. And young Kelly Kaniski now shining his own light instead of standing in the shadow of a former champion intends to change his style completely and make it doubly effective against people like Buddy Landell or anybody else. So Marty Lundy, as he gets in there with that reverse chin lock, now tries to set Buddy up for problems and neat move. Uh, now that's a difficult move to make and he did it well. And he knew why he did it. He got across that ring and touched the hand of his partner in Tony Torres, and, and now Torres stepped in, right into a cauldron. He has both Kaniski and Lundy ready for him. And, oh, that was a hard, hard slam. And of course, the effectiveness of slams can't be doubted. They take it from you physically, and if a man can just follow up the advantage, he can get the pin from a body slam and do it effectively. Reverse chin lock. Kelly Kaniski pouring it to Tony Torres, and Torres getting in that position. This is not a chokehold. Not that uh, Kelly Kaniski wouldn't use a strangle if it was to his advantage, but this is not a chokehold. The man has is holding him, his the chin in the crook of his arm, and this uh, just negates the possibility of, of using it. Crotch hold again, and slam. And... Marty Lundy, top man, there's one, there's two. Tony Torres underneath needs to get across to the other side of that ring and to touch hands with his partner on the outside of the ring. Buddy Landell is anxious, eager to get in, and Torres.
Harris gets punched unmercifully there. there. He has taken a lot of punishment on the back. This shakes the kidneys. This drives the wind right out of you and just racks you from top to bottom. Kaniski, again, using some of the Kaniski style, the knock em dead style of, of his father and of Kelly. Let's just put Kelly where it belongs. Let's just say this is Kelly's style because he is not copying anybody. He's using what comes by instinct, and most wrestlers who wrestle rough are of that nature, and that's why they do it. Everybody in the world is not the shining hero. There are other people who have, get a lot of perverse pleasure out of being rough, rugged, tough, mean, if you will. All of us have known mean people since the time we were kids. Well, here we have the wrestlers who exemplify that part of our life for most assuredly. So Tony's in trouble. He's in bad trouble. He hasn't gotten over to his corner. As a matter of fact, he hasn't gotten out of the clutches of either Marty or Kelly. And as he is uh, piled up in the corner, Kelly lays those hard, hard forearm blows in there. When you hit, the, there it is. A nice try at a save by Buddy Landell. When you hit with a forearm, you don't have to worry about breaking a bone. That's why it's the favorite blow of wrestlers. The other is that it's legal. Fist blows are declared to be illegal, but are not often penalized. <clears throat> a slash across the throat. There's a count, and Tony Torres just barely makes it up. And he did touch. And here comes Landell over that top rope, and uh, there was quite a maneuver. Say, he flies those feet around well. And the quick touch, and Tony Torres was begging to get in there, and the crowd's begging uh, Buddy Landell to stay in that ring. And now Tony is probably wondering why he got back in there so quickly. The touch by Landell was at Tony's insistence, and there's a back body drop, and there is a wrap-up as he pulls that leg up for a cradle hold and glues Tony Torres down to the canvas. So Tony made the call at the wrong time. He got back in that ring when he should have been on the outside, Boyd. And a victory for Kelly Kaniski and his partner, Marty Lundy. We'll be back. Chavo Guerrero versus Matt Thorne after this message from Mid-South Wrestling Television Network. This event is for one fall. Before you introduce this next match, I got something to say. I'm going to get to the bottom of this junkyard dog stagger lead thing once and for all. Now, this is two times they've tried to railroad me. Two times I was supposed to wrestle for the North American title against stagger Lee. One week he doesn't show up. The first week that junkyard dog shows his face. And the next week he doesn't show up tonight. And here comes the junkyard dog again. It's very simple. Junkyard dog, stagger lead, stagger lead, junkyard dog. They're both the same person. Now I'm taking my lawyers and I'm going to the president of Mid-South, Charlie Lay, to matchmaker Grizzly Smith, and I'm going to get something done. I want to match with stagger lead for the North American title around my waist next week. If it had been any other, anybody else, he'd have had to forfeit the match and give me the title and something's going to be done worry about this snap because I'm going to take care of him. Well, time will tell. This event is for one fall or remaining television time. In the red corner at 240 pounds from Atlanta, Georgia, Matt Bourne. And in the blue corner at 235 pounds from Mexico City, Chavo Guerrero. The introduction now. As Rick Pereira calls for the bell, Matt Bourne from Atlanta against the Latin star from Mexico, Chavo Guerrero. Paul? 
So Chavo Guerrero meets the man who can, who may can look straight in the eye, and here are two men about the same weight, about the same experience, and with inclinations to wrestle differently, but they both know wrestling well. Matt Bourne, for all of the fact that he'd rather get in there and kick somebody in the teeth, is a man who has been well-schooled by his father, Tony Bourne. And just look at Chavo Guerrero, and you find another second generation. His dad, Gory Guerrero, was light heavyweight champion of the world and a great star. Chavo has won the junior heavyweight title and equally great. Flying Mare now puts uh, Chavo Guerrero in the driver's seat, and as he gets that knee in behind the neck and manages to bend the axis of the neck, he's got Matt Bourne where he can deal some punishment. The knee is the answer, but as Bourne moves away from it, he is getting to a better position to defend himself and to go on the offensive. Bourne with his back to the ropes, and Guerrero catches a wallop over over the back of the referee and now that he has Chavo Guerrero in some trouble as a quick move by Chavo Guerrero he just went up with the pull that time and it, as he comes in there makes a dive for the legs of Matt Bourne there is an impasse for a moment and both of them looking for the answer to get out and again the wrestling skills of each man come through the roughhouse wrestling that is mixed in between. Slam, and there goes Bourne, who likes to drop on his opponent, and didn't do it that time. It's been responsible for a lot of bad elbows among wrestlers, and and there was a great move by Chavo Guerrero. As Matt Bourne was rolling, he just bounced on that foot and followed him, and it was quick thinking and good balance. Flying feet and beautifully placed. Chavo on top, we could have a fall. Bourne sensed the danger there as those shoulders hit the canvas and Chavo's weight come in on top of him. Born southpaw, and I might say southpaw like his old man because I've got bruises on my head that came because I didn't remember that Tony Bourne at one time was a southpaw and could deal the same kind of blow. So Chavo catches it and now as Matt Bourne just planted that set of knuckles in between the eyes of Chavo Guerrero. He just made him ripe for that body slam. Here's Tony, or rather Matt, <laughs> looking to splash his opponent right through the canvas. Top man is Matt Bourne, could have a fall, but we didn't. Matt in behind. Matt takes a reverse chin lock. He wants to hold him, keep him down on the canvas. He wants to lean his weight on him. He wants to pull that jaw in there. He wants to bend forward, make it make it tough for Chavo to breathe. And Chavo, of course, is fighting against those things happening. And that elbow right looking for the solar plexus could do it. Measured blow with a forearm. The original wrestling wallop and the... Uh, it is as strong today when it's properly used as it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. Caught him in the midsection. Caught him hard in the midsection. And now it's the mark of the boot of Bourne that can be seen on Chavo Guerrero's head to match the one that was given to Matt Bourne. Chavo Guerrero looking at that midsection, and he knows if he can pepper it enough, he gets, gets the head, which is what happened here. Tough give and take. He's looking now for a suplex hold, and up and down, backwards he goes, and a hard crashing landing, but you got to hold him. And sometimes that's the toughest three seconds in the world. Uh, the three seconds you spend just trying to glue a man down to the canvas no matter what hold you're employing to accomplish it. Something about having a man's shoulders, a man having his shoulders down on the canvas, hard miss, hard miss. Getting both those shoulders down on the canvas seems to inspire the fight in everybody if they are born to be wrestlers. They 
That signals to them what to do, how to do it, and they better do it fast. And there is the referee got hit right square in the face with a flying leg. And here is Matt Bourne trying to set up his opposition with a full Nelson, working hard on it to bend that chin. Here comes, here comes the Spearman. And um, it was the feet of the Chavo Guerrero that caught Hacksaw Duggan as he was going through the air and threw him right into Matt Bourne. And Chavo Guerrero came to life. He used his feet in, in a tremendously accurate manner and a bit of instinctive coordination that sent Matt, uh, that sent uh, Hacksaw Duggan head first into his opponent. Here's Tony Atlas, and Atlas is coming in here to get him. We've, we've got the referee still out on the floor, and there, there is a high, high body slam, and now they're trying to set up Hacksaw Duggan into the ropes. A double back body drop, and off onto the floor goes Hacksaw Duggan, who come in there to do his damage and almost succeeded. Matt Bourne is down on the floor, uh, on the a cold concrete floor leaning up against the ring but the winner on a disqualification is Chavo Guerrero and Tony Bourne can surely take credit for a save and an assist exactly and we'll still have time remaining we'll have a tag team match coming up Mr. Racing 2 will be one of the participants right after this word from Mid-South Wrestling It's tag team action now for one fall or remaining television time. In the red corner at 290 pounds. From Clinton, Iowa, Tug Taylor. And his partner at 222 pounds from Jonesboro, Arkansas, Joe Stark. In the blue corner at 236 pounds from Atlanta, Georgia, Mr. Wrestling 2. And his partner at 250 pounds from Topeka, Kansas, Art Cruz. Tag team action now is Mr. Racing 2, the veteran who keeps racking up victory after victory. His partner, Art Cruz from Topeka, Kansas. Paul Bosch having been trained by the veteran Ronnie Etchison. And they're going in against the twosome of Joe Stark and Tug Taylor. Taylor being the larger of the two. In the ring now is Stark and Art Cruz. Here's Paul. So that's Art Cruz bouncing across the ring, 250 pounds of him. And as he takes after Joe Stark, he shows that Ronnie Etchison has indeed done his job well in training this man to wrestle. Boyd, I wrestled Ronnie Etchison in the most unusual place in 1944. We were on our way to Europe. We were on a troop transport and I wrestled him for the entertainment of 7,500 troops on board the troop transport. So I know his mentor well. Tremendous. So <laughs> in comes wrestling number two. Wrestling number two takes a side headlock as his favorite weapon, and he often does this. This is something he likes to apply, but he has a unique style and is addicted to single hold attacks. Again, the, the head, the, the headlock, and the hip all seem fused as he puts them into motion, which is the best thing that Mr. Wrestling 2 has going for him. Oh, the big, man, now. the big man of the team coming in now, Tug Taylor, but nothing in comparison to next week here on Mid-South Wrestling. Seven foot four, 485 pounds, the eighth one of the world. Andre the Giant will be here. I know the fans will be looking forward to next week's edition of Mid-South Wrestling. Well, few people compare with him, but you can say that Kamala compares with Andre the Giant. He may not be quite as big, but big is just a matter of uh, comparison, after all. Side headlock again as the masked Mr. Wrestling 2 manages to take the rotund Tug Taylor down to the canvas. Here is Cruz coming in, and Cruz doesn't suffer from 
any compulsion not to move into his opponent. He, with that 250 pounds of his, he can do it well. That was a driving knee, and Taylor, who is, if he was as good some all the time as he is sometimes, he'd be a pretty tough individual. But his problem is in maintaining a level that is high enough to compete uh, on a, an even basis with the top-notch stars. To be top-notch, you've got to be good all the time. And as Cruz is roughed up, there is Tug Taylor, and if you had him land on you, you have problems too. So Cruz wants to touch, Cruz didn't. And Joe Stark on the outside wants to get in that ring. He wants a piece of, uh, of Cruz with a little help from Tug Taylor. Wrestling number two, still in the throes of trying to find out who has been bugging him by desecrating his masks. Now we've got both of them crawling in there to stop him. Also, Paul, we just have one minute remaining for our time on television, 60 seconds. The action continues. I know each team would like to rack up a victory. But uh, I doubt very seriously if if they know exactly the time. If two knew it, he'd be in that ring right now trying to take over and execute something for which he is famous, and that is the fast pin. And he's a man who can do it. And here he now gets furious, moving in on Joe Stark and wailing away at him as the uh, he belts him down in a rabbit punch, setting him up now, driving the blow into the stomach. He tries to get him into a position so that when he uses that dynamite-laden knee lift, he can do more with it. And there was a top body press, a pin, and through the ropes goes Tug Taylor. He's the guy who got the dynamite from the... Our time the is all lift. gone. They gained the victory. So for our guest commentator, Paul Bosch, I'm your host, Boyd Pierce, and thank you for watching. We'll see you next week on Mid-South Wrestling Television Network.